sum up the Wellington Prince Edward County portion of this video, what I want to highlight is that people have been coming to this part of the world for generations, from the First Nations people thousands of years ago to the agritourists who come here today. They come here primarily because the environmental amenities, benefits and conditions that exist here. If you don't have the good soil and the mild climate and the beautiful beaches, people won't be coming here and living here in the numbers that they have and continue to do so. And unlike many rural areas, Prince Edward County is thriving. There's strong population and economic growth around here, and it's a really bustling place to be. But what is also happening is that the relationship that the people who come here have with nature is continually changing over time. From the First Nations people who came here to hunt, fish, and gather and subsist, to the early settlers who came from the United States to start a farming economy here, to today's grape-based, wine-based, agritourism economy that's injecting new life in the, into the community. So human-environment relations in this part of the world are continually changing. Now I'm going to head about an hour north of here to the Addington Highlands, where human-environment relations are also very important and where tourism is also a very important part of the economy, but the interactions between people and nature are very much different and have also been changing over a very different trajectory over the course of time. I'm now standing about an hour's drive north of Wellington in the settlement of Ardock on the banks of the Mississippi River in North Frontenac Township in the eastern Ontario Highlands. Now, although it's relatively close to Wellington and to Prince Edward County, just, uh, you know, maybe 90 kilometers away, both the natural environment and the environmental history of the, of the region is very different from that down at Lake Ontario. Now, this is a rugged upland country, as you can see from the scenery behind me. It's really just an extension of the Canadian Shield that pushes southward towards Kingston. And so the natural si uh, setting up here is one of forests, lakes, rivers, rugged terrain, not much soil, and a climate that's characterized by relatively short and buggy summers and fairly long and cold winters. And just behind me uh, you'll see the Mississippi River and I'm standing on a bend in that river that has been continuously occupied by people of Algonquin origin since long before European contact. This is going back probably millennia and the family that lives on this land, uh, they are members of the Ardak Algonquin First Nation. And their family has always lived here, and the choice of settlement location here on this bend in the river is fairly typical of Algonquin people in the pre-contact period. They would live at strategic locations around watersheds in eastern Ontario, strategic in the sense where there would be a lot of what we would today call ecosystem services available. The bend in the river providing good fishing, good transportation by canoe because that was the main uh, way they, that Algonquin people got around, but yet access to the forest where there would be foods to be gathered and to be hunted as well. And in the wetlands around here there would also be waterfowl that could be hunted. Now in the 1800s actually, uh, the people who lived at this particular location modify the environment slightly because they brought wild rice to this area from a region called uh, Rice Lake, which is closer towards, uh, towards the east end of Toronto. And so what you'll see in the background are wild rice beds that are planted. And about this time of year, late August, early September, members of the Algonquin community still come here to harvest the wild rice. They use canoes and uh, a traditional stick method to gather the rice grains into the canoe and, process, and then they'll bring them back to shore. Now, European settlement really didn't reach this part of Ontario till until relatively late in the history of, of the province. Although the impacts of European settlement would be felt here long before the first European faces actually appeared. Because in the 17th and 18th century, Europeans brought the fur trade to uh, Eastern North America. And so the Algonquin peoples who lived up here uh, would have participated in the fur trade even before, long before the European settlers actually came to this region. In fact, the way that the Algonquin people of this area, the way they sort of lived their lives was that uh, in the summertime, members of each extended household would paddle downstream, down the Mississippi River, down the Ottawa River to the Lake of Two Mountains, which is just west of Montreal, uh, near the, the community of Oka. And there they would meet people from other First Nations from all around eastern North America, where they would exchange, group, uh, exchange goods and socialize. Um, now, and then after they'd uh, gotten together with and, and had this meeting at the Lake of Two Mountains, then they would come back upstream 
up to the settlements here at these strategic locations where they would pass the winters. Now, um, a lot of changes came after Europeans uh, arrived in eastern North America. The first was the fur trade. The first real physical contact that brought Europeans into this area was the forestry trade. Now, in the 19th century, this area would have been covered by enormous white pine and red pine forests, lots of big hemlocks as well. Uh, and many of these trees would have been 10, 15 feet in diameter and 100 feet tall easily. And so uh, the European settlers wanted to gather these trees to cut them and to drive them downstream to ports where they could then be transported onwards to Europe uh, and later to the United States as well. And they weren't very selective in their cutting. They would often go in and just cut everything in sight in the forest, take out the trees they wanted and leave the rest. And so what you got was what we would today call deforestation on a fairly large scale. What would happen in the wake of deforestation was that all of the residue that was left on the forest floor, all the unwanted branches and so on, they would dry out and in the following summer there would be a high risk of forest fire because of all this essentially flammable material that had been left behind. And so indeed in the late 19th century and early 20th century there were a lot of severe forest fires in this area uh, that were fairly widespread. Now some small settlements did spring up in the region to uh, provide food and uh, supplies to the forestry workers that were out here and many of the forestry workers themselves would uh, spend the winters cutting, uh, cutting in the forest and then in the summertime doing a variety of activities in small settlement farms as well. Uh, but by and large the population of Europeans remained relatively dispersed and diffuse across the landscape sort of like the Algonquins living in small villages not necessarily at strategic locations but at opportunistic locations uh, where you could have sawmills or flour mills. I'm standing on what is today an ATV trail, snowmobile trail, but back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, this was the main highway leading from Napanee down in Lake Ont near Lake Ontario up to the Ottawa Valley community of Renfrew, and it cut through the bush. Now this road was surveyed in the mid-1800s. At that time, most of the good agricultural land in Ontario had already been settled by European settlers. So I'm talking about the land around the lakes, uh, the Great Lakes, down in southwestern Ontario, the flatlands of the Ottawa Valley. And so the colonial government decided that they would survey settlement roads going into the interior and trying to make an overland link between Lake Ontario and the upper Ottawa Valley. And this road here, the Addington Road, was one of the last settlement roads to be established. So back in the 1850s, surveyors came up through this way and uh, corduroy roads were constructed. Corduroy road, roads simply being you knock over trees to form a crude roadbed and then you sort of grade sand and gravel over top of it. And if you wanted to settle up here in the mid 1800s, all you had to do was to come up here, claim some land, and then clear the trees off of it, try to cultivate something and build a permanent uh, habitation on it. It could be a simple a simple uh, wooden shack if you wanted and remain there for a couple of years and if you did you would get title to the land. Now um, the reality is you don't need to be a farmer to see that this is not especially good farmland and so people cleared it, they cut the trees, they found that they couldn't grow much here so many people tried their hand at farming up here, realized they couldn't make a go of it and then moved on or if they did stay up here they would work primarily in forestry and things like that. The road was always in fairly poor condition because once it was built, it was up to the settlers who lived along it to maintain the road in front of their property. And so often people wouldn't spend much time doing it. And so especially in the spring and in the fall, these roads would be fairly impassable. So you didn't get much of a, a permanent population up here. And to be honest, you can't really blame people for not wanting to live up here when you can't farm and when you have to work away from home. So beginning from the 1850s right through to the 1950s, the population up here in Addington Highlands remained relatively low, relatively sparsely distributed across the landscape, primarily on these main roads and little side roads that were cut off of it. And it wasn't really until, oh gosh, the 1940s, maybe even the 1950s, that some of the people who lived up in this area actually got, for example, electricity and telephone up here. So it was very isolated, very remote for much of the 20th century. And so it was into this landscape that a new economy started based around tourism. And so I'm going to go on to Bonneco Provincial Park 
and talk about the tourist economy. I'm standing here at Bon Echo Provincial Park on Lake Mazinaw in the heart of the Eastern Ontario Highlands. Something very important happened here in the early 20th century that changed not only rural life here in the Eastern Ontario Highlands, but indeed had its impact right across uh, Canada in terms of culture and recreation and the way humans relate to the natural environment. And that thing was that in the early part of the 20th century, wealthy people decided that it was fun to be outside. The origins of this uh, began with President Teddy Roosevelt down in the United States, who, even though he was born into a wealthy family in New York City, fancied himself an outdoorsman, a hunter, a cowboy, and as he became a young man, acquired a ranch in South Dakota, uh, wrote books on the great outdoors, and would eventually become President of the United States. And so Roosevelt and people like him, with the same uh, vision and aspirations, began to uh, recreate out of doors, to leave the cities like New York City, Philadelphia, go up into the Poconos, the Adirondacks, and so on, and spend their summers in the great out of doors. And here in Canada, we had the same phenomena going on as well. And a wealthy family by the name of Denison acquired the property here at what is today Bon Echo Provincial Park and established a lodge where people from Toronto, Montreal, and American cities would come up here by rail and then carriage the last 40 kilometers to spend the summer in a lodge that was built here in 1920. And the lodge ran from 1920 to 28. Now remember, this was the Roaring Twenties, the time of Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the Jazz Age, and so on. And so it was a time of great tr uh, cultural transformation in North America. And what was avant-garde at the time was to spend time in the out of doors. And so what we would today call hipsters, uh, young people with lots of money and so on, would be out here recreating in the out of doors. Now, the lodge closed in 1928 and would burn down in the 1930s, but it had a couple important legacies. One is, if you look behind me, the cliffs and the landscape here, if they seem like a Group of Seven painting to you, that's because they are. Uh, members of the Group of Seven came here often in the 1920s to paint the landscapes around here, and these paintings became very popular and indeed have become sort of the iconic images of Canada that we now present to the rest of the world as Canadian art, Canadian landscape, and so on. So that's the first thing, is the cultural influence of the, of the people who came up here in the 1920s. The other was that the desire to spend summers out of doors, whether it's camping or whether it's owning a cottage and, and so on, was not confined just to rich people. And now, even today, it's considered to be a great thing to do in the summertime to spend your summers camping or up at the cottage. And so in the summertime, you'll get hundreds of thousands of visitors here to Bon Echo Provincial Park. Uh, and up in Addington Highlands here generally, the number of cottages on the lakes outnumbers the number of homes that there are of people who live here year-round. And indeed, the population of Addington Highlands actually doubles in the summertime. I should mention that the Denison family that owned the lodge that was built here in the 20s would eventually donate that land to the province of Ontario, and it is today a provincial park for everyone to enjoy.